Hey, Mushroom Nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I'm out on a beautiful Saturday morning looking at mushrooms. Uh, I am in a chanterelle patch right now. If I lean back and over, you can see a couple of the fruiting bodies behind me. So uh, I am having a successful day so far. But I want to talk to you today about uh, our different types of chanterelles in North Carolina because it can be a little bit tricky because they look awfully different under some circumstances because uh, we have different species represented. Cantharellus is the genus that chanterelles belong to. Uh, there's a lot of different species and they're very, very difficult, especially on the East Coast, to get down to uh, a good species. We have a lot of research, I'm sure, that will come out in the next few years or at some point uh, to sort of elucidate and make it a lot easier for, uh, you know, novices and mushroom hunters like me to uh, identify these definitively, uh, you know, two species in the field. Despite the difficulties of identifying, uh, you know, chanterelles to specific species, they are also one of the safest groups of mushrooms to gather uh, for the table. So I have in past videos explained how to identify chanterelles, so I'm not going to bore you with that. But, you know, the TLDR is you have uh, anything from sort of a little waffly looking dude like this to a mushroom that opens up and becomes very uh, sort of vase-like and very flowery. Uh, but I do want to talk to you about uh, a particular type of chanterelle you may see, and it's one of my favorites. This is either Cantharellus persicinus or Cantharellus uh, velutinus. So those are two species that are characterized by being uh, sort of a peachy color. And I'm not sure which one it is, but uh, you know, you can see, especially on the top, it's sort of this like pinky peach color, really attractive. And, uh, you know, the difficulty here is that, like many other chanterelle species, when you harvest these mushrooms, they start to discolor really radically. So you start to get this sort of orangey brown, yellow, uh, you know, sort of amalgamation of color. And this comes in very rapidly. So I harvested this mushroom maybe 10 minutes ago, and you can see already, uh, you know, a lot of discoloration forming. Uh, that said, you know, a lot of our mushrooms uh, or, you know, chanterelles on the East Coast have this behavior. They share that uh, with one of my favorite mushrooms. So those are hedgehog mushrooms and the Hiddenum genus. Uh, we have Hiddenum subgenus alba. It's very, very common in the Southeast. And uh, when you harvest them, they're these beautiful sort of creamy colored mushrooms with little teeth underneath. But when you harvest them, you get uh, a pretty, you know, and this actually is a great example, uh, a staining reaction that is sort of this orangey color. Chanterelles that live in other parts of the, you know, United States don't have this trait necessarily, but that's something that I noticed almost immediately when I started uh, harvesting East Coast chanterelles. So I started out my mushroom hunting adventures in the Pacific Northwest. So we have uh, Cantharellus formosa, uh, the uh, Pacific Northwest golden chanterelle is the, you know, most common species that I was pursuing at the time. And that does not have any staining reactions. So when I first came to North Carolina and I started to, you know, bang up my chanterelles and they started out this beautiful white color underneath, but very promptly started to take on these orangey colors, I was a little bit perplexed until I looked into it a little more deeply. It is a bit on the challenging side if you rely on sites like Mushroom Expert uh, with, uh, you know, descriptions of this uh, sort of reaction. It's more described as yellow or brown. I really don't see yellow brown. What I see is like brownish orange. But, you know, my eyeballs, as you can tell, are not super great. Uh, so, but I would definitely characterize it as such. And again, you know, I just can't get enough of this sort of peachy color uh, you know, I wish that they were a little more bright under this circumstance, but really when you look at the difference between, you know, persicinus or velutinus and a more traditional sort of orangey golden colored chanterelle, you can tell you're in very uh, different territory, different species. That said, they're both delightful to eat. Um, let's see how we're doing on fruity smell. So this one has a really nice, uh, pleasant sort of fruity aroma, which is something I love to see. Let's see what's going on with this one. Nope, not so much. So that's another thing that's interesting about the chanterelles you'll find on the East Coast. A lot of sort of like overall descriptions of the Cantharellus genus describe the mushrooms, of course, as edible, but also um, as often having a sort of apricot or fruity aroma. 
and a lot of the chanterelles that we find in the southeast do not have an aroma so that's not a good identification feature you're really going to be relying on you know this form of false gills uh, so these are more like forked wrinkles rather than true gills and then also a mushroom that has uh, white flesh on the inside and um, you know is growing on the ground sometimes in twos and threes but not uh, you know in a big cluster and I mentioned the big cluster because Omphalatus alludens, uh, the jack-o'-lantern mushroom which is toxic not deadly but definitely an unpleasant experience uh, shares some uh, features with chanterelles so it has uh, gills that run down the stem and that's what uh, you know fouls people up it's also orange but it grows in these big uh, sort of blooms and clusters conjoined at the base you'll sometimes find mushrooms and actually this is a great example of chanterelles that are twins sometimes we see triplets quadruplets but rarely more than I, I very rarely find more than three or four conjoined at uh, the base and they aren't um, you know this is more like they came up right next to each other and they're kind of attached but in the case of Omphalatus alludens when you pick it it's like oh this is all mushrooms growing you know like little fingers from a central base uh, so that's just something to be aware of so um, that's all I really have to say about chanterelles for today but you know again this uh this sort of color and form is really distinctive but uh like you have even um the Cantharellus phasmatis, the ghost chanterelle, uh, is very, and Cantharellus deceptivus also as well, uh, have, you know, a very white undersurface, but they also, and I think it's one of these two is what I'm holding right here, will start to uh, discolor this orangey uh, sort of pigment. Um, I've heard tell that that could be beta carotene. I do know that as far as, uh, you know, nutrition, chanterelles are fairly high in vitamin D. For my purposes, I just find them to be really tasty and it's also a delightful experience. You know, sometimes mushroom hunting can feel to me almost a little like, frantic's the wrong word, but scattered because I'm, I'm looking at all kinds of different mushrooms. I'm picking up all kinds of specimens. And when I'm in a chanterelle patch, especially this particular chanterelle patch, there is a lot less uh, fungal diversity. So I'm just focusing on collecting some food for myself and uh, then I will go on my way and do some of the more from, you know, frenetic identification uh, focused gathering. Uh, before I leave you for today, I also want to share this lovely specimen of Areobolitis betula, another good edible mushroom for the summertime, certainly less known than the chanterelle, but that's unfortunate because this is actually a really tasty mushroom. So uh, very, very simple to identify if you, uh, you know, have some basic familiarity with the different parts of a mushroom. So you have a cap and stem mushroom. Underneath you have this very, very bright yellow sponge, uh, sponge layer. So I'm going to open that up so you can see what it looks like. So it's basically little tubes or a sponge and that's where uh, the spores come from. So uh, a mushroom that has gills, those uh, spores form sort of in between those gills and they drop off. But in the case of bolete type mushrooms, so these uh, tubed or spongy mushrooms, uh, the, you know, the spores mature on the inside of that and then they come out. So, uh, the Areobolita spatula, the common name is the shaggy stalked bolete, and I bet you can guess why. So it's got this really beautiful reddish color with yellow shags that are very pronounced and sort of, uh, vertical with these little connection points. So it's, uh, also a very, like, relatively speaking, tall and skinny mushroom. So a lot of mushrooms that you'll see with spongy underbottoms are like, like fat and big on the top and big on the bottom but Areobolita spatula is really uh you know tall and slender and also has this small uh cap cap wise this is probably the prettiest you'll ever see it so this nice dark uh sort of cherry color you have a beautiful uh orange uh, or excuse me yellow uh sort of golden rim around the edge of the cap margin so it, you know, in addition to these shaggy, uh, st you know, the shaggy stalk, this sort of um, yellowish rim is really distinctive for Areobolitis betula. Uh, but the cap can vary in color pretty dramatically. So it oftentimes starts out this really beautiful reddish color, but by the time it is mature and this sponge is sort of, you know, turned, it's faded out and the spores have started to disperse, you have uh, much more often like a pale yellow color. 
So boletes are, are a pain in the butt to identify often. Um, there's a lot of reasons that's the case, but one of the reasons is their extreme variability in color and sort of appearance throughout their life cycle. Ario boletus betula, for, you know, fortunately, it doesn't change very radically except on the cap. All right, let's talk about eating this sucker. The best thing to do is just pop off the cap and leave it here. I sometimes eat them, but I uh, recently attended a mushroom camp. It was a week long with Dr. Uh, Allen and Arlene Bissett, the authors of many, many uh, field guides for the southeastern U.S. It was a wonderful experience and one of the gazillion things I learned during my week of mushroom camp was that it really is best uh, to just, you know, focus on the stems of these because the cap is a little finicky and they're kind of sticky and they, 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 the flesh is not nearly as dense. And so if you're preparing it or messing around with it, you're just gonna have a little more difficulty like throwing it in a pan alongside the stems. And the stems on the other hand are nice and firm. Uh, what you can do uh, if you open it up is you'll see that it's sort of a pale yellow on the inside, oftentimes with a little uh, sort of margin of this reddish color. But what you want to do is, you know, if, if you're particular, you can scrape off these shags really easily uh, if you're interested in doing that. This one's not actually all that shaggy and I wouldn't probably bother unless I were making a video, but sometimes these are like the shags are really, really big and gnarly. So you can scrape them off and then you cook this mushroom. It has a really nice sort of um, citrusy thing going on. I, also at mushroom camp, I just can't stop talking about it because it was so fun. Um, we had uh, some green beans uh, prepared with uh, shaggy stalk boletes and it was delicious. It was a really nice sort of blend of, of flavors. So I'm gonna take this one home with me along with my chanterelles. I'm gonna see if I can get some decent pictures of this uh, sort of peachy color. It's really difficult to say, okay, that's really pinky and peachy unless you put it, you know, right next to one of these bright orange fellows. But as soon as you do so, you're like, oh yeah, those are really, really different looking mushrooms. But underneath you still have false gills, you still have the white flesh, you still have sort of stringiness like string cheese. Um, and you know, whether or not you get an aroma is um, kind of, I don't know if that's dependent entirely on species, but anyway, these in particular don't have um, a fruity aroma. So anyway, I know it's been a couple of weeks since I published. Uh, I'm going to blame Mushroom Camp. I'm still like absorbing and re-digesting the information that I received when I was there, but it was super enlightening and uh, really relit the fires of my passion for mushrooms. And I hope that you are doing quite well with your mushroom season yourself.